All right, ACC, I want to welcome you here at Victorville. For those of you joining us in Apple Valley today, a big welcome to you. For those in Hesperia, a howdy hey. And for those watching online, we're glad you're here. Well, we are continuing in our Exiles series, and we have a guest speaker today that I'm really excited to introduce to you. His name is Aaron Levy. Aaron has been on staff at Abundant Living Family Church down in Rancho Cucamonga for the last eight years. His role there is pastor of operations, which has included him being a campus pastor at one of their other campuses in the city of Pomona. And so Aaron has just been walking with the Lord. We had a great time at dinner last night, getting to hear a little bit more of our stories and just appreciate his faithfulness to what God has called him to. We have some cool connections. By the way, Aaron has, or has been married to Erica for 16 years. They have three beautiful daughters. Their oldest is uh, married and they have a son-in-law now as well. And that's a really cool uh, situation in their new family dynamic. Um, with that, we at HGC have some connections to Aaron as well. You might remember last summer when we were going through a series on Proverbs, it was actually Aaron's book that we recommended to you, 31 Daily Drips of Wisdom. It was just such a great resource to help us where it feels like the ideas in Proverbs are just ping-ponging all over the place, how to kind of settle into a, a key word in that particular chapter that day and process that with a series of great questions and some thoughtfulness. So that's Aaron's as well as Aaron was our high school summer camp speaker up at Forest Home this last summer and our students had such a great experience with him. So on all of our campuses online, would you give a big welcome to Aaron Levy? Thanks, Todd. Good morning. Can we continue to give a round of applause for our lead pastor, Todd Arnett, and the entire HDC team? Love Todd Arnett. What I didn't know is that he's also a good singer. I was sitting next to him last night and this morning, and he's a good tenor. I don't know if he ever leads worship, but I'm calling on the God. That's how he sounded this morning. I was like, man, that's, that's pretty cool. Well, hey, Apple Valley. Hey, Hesperia. My name's Aaron Levy. Hey, those that are watching online, what an honor to be here at HDC. I have loved your church for over a decade. Um, fun fact, one of my closest friends, Willie and Raquel Jones, brought me to HDC back in like 2012. And that's when you were going through a series called Route 66, where you had the journal and going through the entire Bible. I went through the entire Bible with you guys from my church. So your church has always had a special uh, place in my heart. My favorite series ever from HDC is King Me, Principles of Leadership that I'm still learning from today. So just love your house. Um, who's been enjoying this Exile series? You guys been enjoying it? It's been awesome. And last time we were in 1 Peter, Jody took us to 1 Peter chapter 4, and he did a masterful job talking about hope through suffering. Hope through suffering. And I want to continue that thought because I'm going to just be in um, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. So if you have your Bibles, you can start going over there. And I want you to help me with the sermon title. Whether you're in Apple Valley, Hesperia, or right here, I want you to look to your neighbor and say, be a team player. Okay. Look to the other neighbor, you probably suspect that they weren't gonna be a team player, and say, be a team player. One of the things that helps us continue to have hope when we suffer is knowing that we're on a team, that we don't suffer alone. And thank God for community so that way when we go through tough times, if we're a part of a team, we're not suffering alone and that keeps us hopeful. You know, it reminds me back in the day when I was a basketball coach for my church, I would coach young kids about age 11 to about 16 and I had this kid on my team, he was the most skilled player but he wasn't much of a team player. And I was trying to work with him because I was telling him, hey, anybody could be a good player. If you want to be a great player, you got to get the people around you to get better and you got to be a better team player. So I wasn't just working on his skills. I was trying to work on his heart and his character, his attitude. And we would always pray before our games. So I said, hey, buddy, before this game, why don't you be a leader and why don't you pray? He was like, Aaron, what do you want me to pray? And I was like, pray whatever is on your heart. So he grabs his teammates' hands 
and he closes his eyes and he says, Lord, bring us some better team members. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's win. He was honest. He prayed what was on his heart, but his prayer wasn't in the will of God. And it kind of reminds me of Peter, because if you think about Peter's team, his 12, he was kind of a star as well. He was one of the top three. But sometimes he wasn't the best team player. And what's so cool about going through 1 Peter is we know his writings, but we also know his story. I serve at Abundant Living Family Church. My pastor is Pastor Adam. And later this year, he's going to drop a book about marriage. And it excites me because I, I don't just know his content I know his story, I know his wife, I seen their struggles and I see them overcome. So now I have more of a, a credibility of seeing the writings. And that's what we get to do in First Peter, because if you looked at the gospels, if you look in the book of Acts, you would see why he would be so passionate to have certain themes that we're seeing in First Peter. One of them being suffering, because Peter had to learn the hard way. So, him being a team player and emphasizing that is probably because there were times when he struggled. And there were three key plays that he's sharing with us in verse 7 through 11 that'll help us to be a better team player. The first one, if you're looking in your notes, is keep praying. Keep praying. We're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. I'll be reading from NIV. And, all, and online and campuses, lock in with me. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of a sober mind so that you may pray. The first thought I want to ask us as we dive into this first play of being a better team player is do you have a prayer list or do you have a prayer life? That'll be in your notes that you could put down. Do you have a prayer list or do you have a prayer life? I'm going to be honest with you. When I first came to Christ, I just had a prayer list because Jesus loves me and Jesus doesn't want me to suffer, right? So all the things that I would suffer through and many times suffering is situations that we go through with people. So I would just jot down that list and God, will you change my spouse? Will you change my boss, change my financial situation, change my health, change my kids, change, in Jesus' name. <laughs> and a prayer list. So a prayer list is more, God, change my situation. And the longer that I'm in my faith journey, one of the things that I'm learning is everything is father filtered. So sometimes God in his infinite wisdom will entrust trials to us so not that we just have situations changed, that God will change us through the situations. So a prayer life is more, God, would you change me through this situation? In Peter, we can tell that he's reiterating this point, and that's why I love this series, because he's echoing what he did in chapter one. If we look at 1 Peter chapter one, verse 13, I'll read it in NIV, it may be on the screens. It says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope, remember last week, hope through suffering, on the grace to be bought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Now we see here in um, chapter 1, verse 13, two words, alert and sober-minded. And we see here in our text today, chapter 4, verse 7, alert and sober-minded. And whenever the Bible repeats a word, I lean in and I try to get the understanding of what that word means so I can apply it in my life. So let's look at these two key words. The first one being alert. In Greek, it means sophroneho, which means to exercise self-control. What it means is have your minds prepared for the right action. Sober in the Greek means nepho which means having clear judgment, being free from illusion. There's a translation in, in, in 1 Peter 1.13 that says, gird up the loins of your mind. 
The swagger back then for the leaders, they would wear these robes and it would be hard for them to run. And so when they had to get somewhere quickly, they would have to tie up and gird up the loins so that way when they walk, they won't be tripped up. So what Peter is doing is using a play on words and saying, don't have things tripped up in your mind for the sake of your prayers. And with him talking about self-control and him talking about having a sober mind, I wanted to put this point. It'll be in your notes. When we aren't sober-minded, we lack self-control. When we're not sober-minded, we lack self-control. Now, some of us know when we're not sober, we lack self-control. That's the low-hanging fruit with alcohol. But it may go deeper than that because whenever we suffer... It's challenging for us to be sober. If we think about last week when Jody was talking about 1 Peter chapter 4, there was a verse in verse 3 that says, hey, we're Christians now. We're not doing drunken parties. We're not going to orgies. We're not focused on drunkenness. And some of us are like, amen. I used to get drunk. I don't drink anymore. I don't let alcohol touch my lips. But what if it's deeper than that? We may not be taking shots of tequila anymore. But are we taking shots of shame? Do we get intoxicated mentally or emotionally? Are we still hungover from hurts in our past? We may not be going to external drinking parties, but there may be internal drinking parties replaying episodes of the past that keeps us intoxicated and we take that intoxicated mindset to our prayers. That's what Peter is talking about. And we can learn from Peter because Peter struggled with this. And that's why I love knowing someone's story because it informs their writing. So if we use our holy imagination and we look at Peter's prayer journal, we can see four things here. And it's in your notes that we can get mentally and emotionally intoxicated in four areas. By our fear, by our worry, by our success and by our failure. What you'll see in your notes, you'll see those four situations and I'm gonna talk about four different times in Peter's life that kind of brings color to that. To fear, worry, success, and failure. The first one, let's talk about fear. In Luke chapter five, that's when we meet Simon. Simon Peter. He wasn't always Pastor Peter. Back then, he was just sinful Simon. He's an entrepreneur. He has a fishing business. Doesn't have that good of a day. Jesus meets him on his boat, and he reluctantly follows Jesus' advice. And when he gets into the presence of God, he gets fearful because he knows who he is. And his fear informs his prayer. And he says, Lord, depart. That's in your notes. Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man, oh Lord. And the fear that we have, the pressure that it may be to be in church, to be in the presence of God. Lord, just depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Intoxicated prayer when it's driven by fear. But in that moment, if you know the story, what ends up happening, Jesus responds to him and says, fear not. From now on, you'll be a fisherman of men. And what's good about knowing this about Peter's prayer is when we're honest about our fears in the presence of the Lord, we'll get a revelation from God that we could keep following him amidst our fear. And Peter would take that to the next episode that I want to talk about, which is in your notes. The second, the first one was fear. The second one is worry. And what we'll use for that is Matthew chapter 14, verse 30. Many of us know the story. Peter's team is in a storm. And he wasn't the best team member in that moment because Jesus starts walking on the water in that storm. And then Peter says, Jesus, is that you? Command me to come to you on the water. And he starts walking on water, leaving his team behind, trying to get to Jesus. But the winds and the waves get the best of his mindset. And he gets intoxicated by worry. And he shares one of the best prayers that we can ever pray. Drowning in a situation based upon worry. Lifting up his hands and say, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. That's in your notes. 
So you see his prayer life matures before, Lord, depart from me. Now, Lord, save me. I'm going to trust that you said from now on I'm going to be with you. And now he sees in that moment that no matter what situation I'm going through, I'm not going to be intoxicated by worry because I can lift up my hands and say, Lord, save me. The same Jesus that saved Peter is the same Jesus that will save you. No matter what drowning situation that you're faced with today, this is what's very important. In that moment, picture Peter coming off the moment where Jesus would tell him, you're going to be a fisher of men. In the next episode of his life, he's drowning, being saved by Jesus. What I believe is Jesus is using Peter as an illustration of his calling. Why is that an encouragement for me? And I hope it's an encouragement for you because no matter what waters you feel like you're drowning in today, as God saves you from those waters, he will bring purpose to it because he confirms that as a calling. So when you see other people drowning in their life, you can help them. So God brings purpose to our pain. And now Peter learns more about Jesus, but he starts getting intoxicated by success. Because if you keep reading Matthew, you're going to read Matthew 16, and Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom. Jesus affirms Peter as a leader, and now I'm successful. And if we go all the way to Luke chapter 22, we can get intoxicated by our success, and it impacts our prayer life. Jesus is trying to get Peter to focus in the moment, but he's intoxicated. And instead of saying, Lord, save me, his prayer changes. Luke twenty two thirty three. 33, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to go to prison. I'm ready to die for you, Jesus, because I'm a leader. I'm your guy. Jesus wasn't even asking for all that. And sometimes when we have seasons of success, he's not drowning anymore. He's leading. He's praying. He's learning how to be a disciple. And he's thinking, I don't know about my team, but I'm your boy. You can trust me. That same night, since he was intoxicated by success, he learns, I'm not the man I thought I was. That ended up being his worst night of failure because that's the night where he denies Jesus three times. And then his intoxication from success goes instantly to being intoxicated by failure. And if you look at that fourth one, failure, the scripture will look at that is Luke chapter 22, verse 61. What ends up happening is Peter denies Jesus three times. And he's following at a distance and he gets eye contact with Jesus. And the scripture says he remembered the sayings of the Lord. In verse 62, he went out and wept bitterly. There's been seasons of that in my life where I've tried so hard to be successful for Jesus. That's religion. I want to be good enough to get to Jesus. And then I find I'm at a distance from Jesus. And now in my lifestyle, I'm denying who Jesus is. And now I'm finding myself lamenting and repenting because I'm remembering the saying of the Lord. And it causes me to weep. It is okay that sometimes your prayers or just the tears coming down your cheeks. Because you recognize I'm in the presence of God. God, you told me you would save me. You told me I'll have a from now on moment. God, I need another from now on moment. And see, this brings a little more color to our prayer life because as we, as we journal through uh, Peter's story, what about our story? If we start surveying our prayers, Apple Valley, what does that look like for us? How would people describe our prayers? And it's in our notes for something for us to have tension with. Do you seek self-control or situation control? Many times in my life, my prayer life, it's just been about situation control because I don't trust God enough yet for that area. So I want to work it out in my own strength and my intoxicated mindset doesn't trust God. So I'll only revert to situation control. But the fruit of the spirit is self-control. The common thread through this whole series is God is in control of who's in control. Peter would learn that he's in control of the winds and waves. Peter would also learn I'm in control 
of your sin account because I can wipe it away. But we look at this, not like, man, that's a crazy story about Peter. We look at this by taking an inventory in our life. Man, do I have a prayer list or a prayer life? In this period, if we're thinking about how do I become more effective in my prayers, what we do is the same thing Jesus did with Peter, we do with us. We look at the Lord's Prayer. One of the two things that was great in the book of Matthew is we learn the greatest commandment. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40. Love God, love neighbor. And if we look at the Lord's prayer, the Lord's prayer is brought brought in two spaces. Love God, love neighbor. There's a graphic on the screen. You may want to take a picture of it or take notes or what have you because this could help us to be more effective in our prayer life. Because if I analyze Peter's prayer, Peter is praying the unholy trinity. What's the unholy trinity? Me, myself, and I. Lord, save me. Lord, depart from me. Lord, I'm ready. But if we look at this prayer, it starts with our father. I have a father and I'm a part of a a spiritual family. I have siblings. I'm not just going on behalf of me. I'm going on behalf of my oikos. And look at the order of the prayer. I love God in my prayer, then I love neighbor. I'm going to exalt your name, I'm going to exalt your kingdom, and I'm going to exalt your will. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, as I exalt the name of Jesus, as I proclaim to God, I want your will over my desires. Now it gives me a sober mind to how I pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Now give me this day. See, before I read the Lord's Prayer, I would say, Lord, you know my wife, and I love her, and you love her, but here are the list of things that I expect you to change by sundown. (laughs) And what I would learn is God would allow my wife to be a certain way to be sandpaper for my discipleship. Now, I love my wife. And my wife would describe me in the same way. And we, we used to pray together, just like the, just like the, the, te- the, the kid on the, te- on the team. Change, Aaron. Just change him, Lord. Until we recognize the tension that we have towards each other is God helping us to become more like him. Helps us to be more sober-minded. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. So we're not going to just ask for forgiveness for ourselves. God, in in the presence of God, as we ask for God's mercy, he expects us to give mercy. Not God deliver me. God deliver us. And as we exalt God's name, as we exalt his kingdom, as we desire his will, it changes how we pray. Amen? Amen. So that's the first key of being a better teammate. We're going to keep praying. The second key is keep loving. Keep loving. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. I'm going to read from NIV. All right, here we go. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. So I love this series because we're looking at 1 Peter and all of its context. Earlier in my first point, we looked at what Peter is saying in chapter 4 is an echo of chapter 1. It's the same thing here for the second point. Because if we look at 1 Peter 1.22, let's look at it in NIV. It says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Same word, one another, teammate. Pastor Todd talked about uh, 1 Peter 1.22, and the title of his message was Love One Another Deeply. And now I get an opportunity to continue that 
Because it's in Peter's mind. And why is it in Peter's mind? Because there was opportunities where he could have loved Jesus more deeply or could have learned, loved his team more deeply. And now has, as he reflects as a pastor, that's with the passion that's in his heart. So if, if we look here at the word deeply, because they said it twice, I wanted to know what it meant. If we look in the Greek, it means ektenese. Two words, ek, which means wholly out of, and teneo, which means to stretch. It means tension. It means constant. And I pictured my heart, the love that I have, coming wholly out of my heart, stretching out to cover those that do me wrong. Okay, that's hard. That's not normal. And it's in your notes. Anyone can start loving one another. It takes forgiveness to keep loving one another. That's why Peter is saying love each other deeply and that deeply I'm going to cover you because Peter recognized he's been covered and Jesus has challenged, G ch challenged Peter to cover others. And that's so counterculture. Oh my gosh. Because we're in a cancel culture society. I love you until you do me wrong. And when you do me wrong, cancel. And now what social media does, because everybody's getting canceled, now we say, I got the receipts. I got the receipts. I got the screenshots of the text messages. I prove that you did me wrong, cancel. The kingdom of God shouldn't have a cancel culture. We have a council culture. But when we're consumed by the culture that we're around, sometimes we're canceling our brothers and sisters. So can I tell you a story about receipts that convicted me? Uh, Victorville is not certain. Apple, Apple Valley, can, can I tell you guys a story about receipts? I felt, I felt Apple Valley's passion. Okay, so... <clears throat> I love going to Popeye's chicken with my daughters. I'm going to Popeye's chicken and I get a three piece, red beans and rice, two biscuits with the butter. Yes, yeah, two biscuits. Two biscuits. I'll be like, let me get that extra biscuit. Get back to the house and I look in my box, got the chicken, got the bare beans and rice, no biscuits. I'm upset. I got my 12 year old, my 10 year old, and I'm throwing it. I don't have my biscuits. <laughs> so I pull out the receipt and I call Popeyes. Popeyes, I'm gonna need my biscuits. Well, sorry, sir. You can come to the store and we'll give you your, I don't wanna come to your store. <laughs> well, we give you your money back. You got to come to the store. I don't want to go to your store. Just wire me the money immediately. Don't have fit. And they can't do it. Let me speak to the manager. And then Marisol gets on the phone. How do I know her? Because I've had to repent about this, okay? <laughs> so I talked to Marisol and she's, she's trying to work it out. And I'm just showing her, hey, you said you were going to do something for me that you didn't do. And you need to fix it, and you got to fix it the way I want you to fix it. I don't want to put no skin in the game in fixing this. I just want to share my pain. So then what happens is Marisol says, sir, there's nothing we can do. So I said, okay, I'm going to hold on to this receipt, and I'm going to come up there later. And I put this receipt on my refrigerator. Now, here's the problem with the receipt now being on my refrigerator, because now this is not an isolated incident. Now, every time I'm getting food, I'm thinking about Marisol. <laughs> I'm thinking about biscuits. I'm not even going for biscuits. I'm getting cereal, but I think about biscuits. <laughs> and then the Lord deals with me, y'all. A couple weeks later, I go on a trip with my pastor. And we go to a conference and we have per diem. So all I got to do in that situation is pull out this receipt and I scan it with my phone, and the company covers it. And after the company covers it, all I do, I just rip up this receipt. I don't, I don't know the manager's name. I don't even remember what I ordered because it's covered. I released it. I don't have to deal with it. 
So as I released all those receipts, have a great time at the conference, I come back home, I want to get something to eat, and look what's stapled to my refrigerator. (laughs) And it's like, Aaron, you got yourself covered. Why can't you cover others? And sometimes that happens in the kingdom of God. Thank you, God, so much for your mercy. God, I've, rem- I've memorized Isaiah 43, 25. You choose not to remember my sins. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Marisol, give me my biscuits. <laughs> How easy is it to enjoy the mercy of God, but expect justice from others? And if Peter is going to say love covers a multitude of sin, it's not just your sin. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those that trespass against us. It's okay to clap at church. It's holy. Peter will reflect on this because if we look at Luke chapter 22, verse 31, remember when he said, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to die for you. Well, let's look at this. Watch this. <clears throat> Luke chapter 22, 31 through 34. I love the Bible because look how Jesus talks to Simon Peter. All throughout their relationship, sometimes he will refer to him as Simon, sometimes Simon Peter, and sometimes just Peter. And there's meaning behind that because Simon means listen, Peter means rock. Which Jesus is trying to teach Peter as a disciple, if you listen, you could be a rock in my church. So look at this, verse 31, Simon, Simon, what are you saying? Listen, listen, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And we have turned back, strengthening your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death, intoxicated. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, you're still Peter. You're still in your identity, but you're going to fail. The rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Remember remember Peter said, have a sober mind. Be ready for the right action. Because he probably reflected on this moment when he was not ready for the right action. Because Jesus asks him to pray. He doesn't pray. He goes to sleep. And then when he wakes up, he says, hey, what's going on here? Judas just kissed Jesus? Who's this Malchus cat? Oh, no, no, no. And he pulls out a sword and he tries to kill Malchus. Now, you got to understand, he's an entrepreneur. He's not a thug. So he's, he probably used it as a, as a fishing net. That's why he missed him and just cut off his ear. But this is a beautiful, sobering moment in Simon Peter's life. Because he hurts Malchus. Malchus' ear falls off. And Peter sees Jesus Pick up Malchus' ear and heal Malchus. And Peter gets sober because he reflects, listen, listen. And listen to me, church leaders. When we're intoxicated by success, not only do we not listen to Jesus, we cut off the ears of others to listen to Jesus. Think about Malchus. If you, all you got to do is go to social media and you'll see thousands of Malchuses that are expressing that they're hurt by a church leader. Can you picture Malchus on TikTok? Man, that Pastor Peter was supposed to be there for me. He was in the presence of Jesus. He cut my, he tried to kill me. But this is what Malchus would have to deal with. Hey, Malchus, people will break your heart. Only Jesus can heal your heart. So Malchus, for the rest of his life, can either think about Peter or he could be grateful for Jesus. And may that be the tension for us as we think about and reflect on Jesus' hands. It's in your notes. If we see Jesus' hands, he uses hands to heal Malchus' ear. And with (laughs) with those same hands, those were the hands that were pierced. They were nailed to a cross. But after he resurrects, you know what he does in John 21? He goes back and finds Peter and prepares breakfast for him. Because Peter gave up on Jesus, but Jesus didn't give up on Peter. You got to read it for yourself, John chapter 21. He gives him an opportunity to repent and restore. And Malchus can reflect and say, you know what? 
I guess love does cover a multitude of sin when I include Jesus. It's when we look to the person that offended us to fix us, that's when we get stuck. But if we want to continue loving and keep loving, we say, God, I'm going to keep praying about this because you have called me to love and this is preventing me from loving. And what will happen is Jesus would heal you. That doesn't mean that Malchus and Peter have to be friends, but it does mean Malchus could be free. And for Peter, one of the things he recognizes, I got another from now on moment. I failed Jesus. I thought I was going to be so successful, but Jesus would still meet me at my boat again like we met in the beginning. He would still allow me to be this pastor in the book of Acts. And that's why Peter has the credibility to challenge us and say, keep loving, because love covers a multitude of sin. Amen? So in your notes, how do we keep loving? We have to have this perspective, church. We focus on what Jesus does for you more than what they did to you. Focus on what Jesus does for you more than what they did to, to you. Since Jesus keeps covering us, let us keep covering one another. The first play, keep praying. Second play, keep loving. Third play, keep serving. First Peter 4, 9 through 11. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you <clears throat> should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever. Amen. If we're going to keep serving, the word that stood out to me is steward. Now, what is a steward? If you look in the Greek... It's oikonomos. And it means that you're not the owner, but you're the house manager. You're a public ambassador for Christ. And that's so cool for this house because it's connected to the word oikos, which means house, dwelling, your family, your people. And what God is saying, as you keep praying, I'll empower you to keep loving by, keep, by continuing to serve those that are in your oikos. <clears throat> God expects us to be stewards of the gifts that he's given us. But if you look in our notes, the gifts that we have depend on God's grace. They don't depend on our skill, they depend on God's grace. There's a graph that I put on the, ta on the, on the, on the screen right now. The three gifts that are listed are hospitality, speaking, and serving. But look at the grace that we need. Hospitality with no grumbling. Have you ever been hospitable to somebody in your house? And as soon as they leave, oh God, thank God they're gone. Man, did you see how they was complaining? They ate all our food. We got no leftovers. We got, okay, hospitality, no grumbling. We need grace for that. Speak the words of God. Not the words of emotions. Not the words of the receipts. The words of God. God, love covers a multitude of sin. God can forgive. God can heal. Serve. Through God-supplied strength. God will give us the strength to serve. There are definitely times in my life in the past, I just don't got enough time to serve. I don't have enough capacity to serve because I'm too big. But I wasn't praying for God's grace to serve. I was just looking at my time management. But if God has called us to serve, maybe we can go to God for grace. God, I know you've called me to keep loving, and the way that you want me to express love is through service. You've given me these gifts. Will you give me the grace to do that? And as we conclude, the kingdom of God is like having a white elephant gift party every day. Hesperia, have you ever been to a white elephant gift party? I love them because what ends up happening is I go out shopping. A lot of times it's me and my wife together and we go shopping for the community. We don't know who's going to get the gift but we know that it's gonna be good for them. Sometimes we, we have parties and it's a gag gift or sometimes we wanna make people feel special and there's a joy when you have a gift, you give it to someone you love and you see the expression on their face when they open the gift. 
That's the kingdom of God. Every single one of us have varied gifts based upon God's grace. So every time we get together, somebody gets encouraged, somebody gets challenged, somebody gets helped, whatever that looks like as we continue to serve our oikos. And sometimes in God's infinite wisdom, what I've learned in my faith journey, God will assign suffering to us at times as gifts. God in his wisdom will give me a situation that doesn't meet my expectations. And when I look at this, what ends up happening is God gives me an opportunity to see what's on the inside of me. Aaron, what is that in you that allows you to respond in front of your kids like that? What is that in you that, that's holding this grudge? Why are you holding on to this receipt? And with time, it's, it ends up being a story that I can share that we can laugh at. But there was a time where I was really frustrated about this. Why am I frustrated about this? Because I was serving with, with not God supplied strength. So then when situations come to my mind, now I'm already on edge. And sometimes God will assign these challenges in our life as gifts with time because it no longer stings in our life. It's now a story we can share. Speaking of that, you know, the common thread through this whole series is God is in control of those that are in control. And I was reflecting on that on my front porch and I'm praying for HDC and I'm thinking about the message and I'm outside on my front porch. I can, I can feel the breeze and I hear the birds and I'm getting inspired. I'm looking at scripture. And then all of a sudden I look up under my front porch and I see the biggest wasp's nest. Oh my God. Now let me be honest, Apple Valley. I'm not the toughest guy. So I'm in the front yard I got my Bible, my coffee, it looks great. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, God. And I'm just making, <laughs> people driving by like, what is wrong with this guy? And sometimes we live life that way. That I just want to make sure I don't get stung. So I'm going to go back inside because it ain't safe out here. But in that moment, I look and I saw the wasp nest. But if I keep looking, not at the wasp kingdom, the kingdom of God. God's in control of who's in control. So even if I get stung by a wasp, now I gotta trust God for healing and I get to know God more. Whatever that looks like in your life, that wasp nest, that may be your boss, that may be your marriage, that may be your health. Whatever that situation, God in his infinite wisdom won't eliminate all the wasps from our life because it teaches us to trust who he is in the process. It tests if we're gonna keep praying, keep loving, and keep serving. Let's pray. God, thank you for the revelation that you've given in your word today. Thank you that love covers a multitude of sin. Thank you for saving Peter out of the water when he said, Lord, save me. And there are some of us in this room that feel like we're drowning, either in situations we've caused or situations that have been done to us. And I pray in the name of Jesus as you're ministering to hearts right now. Some of us may not have started our faith journey with you. And I pray that you would give us the courage to admit that we are sinners, that we've fallen short of the glory of God, but that we can be an encourage, encourage in this moment and believe that anything that we're holding onto in our hands, your hands was pierced for. You died on the cross for our sins. We can believe in the gospel and we're gonna choose a life to have values that line up in that gospel. We're gonna give our lives to you. We're gonna continue our faith journey with you so we can keep praying, keep loving, and keep serving. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
Amen. And would that be on your heart this week as you think about, God, how can I be that kind of team player in, in my life and the different relationships I have? If you prayed with Pastor Aaron today to respond to the gospel, would you mark that on your, your welcome form so we can follow up with you this week? And if you're here and you're like, man, I wrote a prayer request down, but I don't want to leave here before someone prays for me. We have folks down front. Pastor Aaron's going to be here. I'll be here. And other folks on our prayer team, come get prayed for before you leave today. We love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.